Hello, everyone. This is Alfred Weaver. I'm the professor of computer science at the University of Virginia, and my pleasure to be a co-editor of this special issue. And today, it's our pleasure to have with us one of the authors of one of our papers, Gary Miller, Chancellor at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Gary, welcome. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Great. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself and so our audience will know a little bit about you. Absolutely. I'm uh, Chancellor of University of North Carolina, Wilmington, which is part of the University of North Carolina system, one of the uh, comprehensive universities in the system. I'm an ecologist by training and uh, have spent my entire year uh, career in higher education, both as a faculty member, researcher, and uh, as an administrator, department chair, dean, and provost and chancellor. And so now I'm at uh, Wilmington um, working to um, uh, develop uh, models for uh, university engagement. Great. Thank you. So now I'd like to ask you uh, a few questions. And the first one is uh, responsive to the very beginning of your article in the special issue where you quote Nathan Harden writing in the American Interest magazine where he um, opened his piece with this very provocative statement, and I'm quoting now, in 50 years, if not much sooner, half of the roughly 4,500 colleges and universities now operating in the United States will have ceased to exist, unquote. So that's certainly a provocative statement. So I'll ask you, to what uh, degree uh, do you uh, either agree or disagree with his premise? Well, I, I hope it's hyperbolic. Uh, in the second sentence of that quote, he, he also makes the claim that this uh, change is already underway and that nothing can stop it. Uh, I think the thrust of his uh, thinking is has to do with access to uh, college education, and I, and I think there's much more to it than that. Um, uh, I, I still believe there's, um, there's a lot of uh, space between uh, a student of whatever age starting a college education and uh, understanding and, and gaining an understanding from that education. And I think that's part of what I'm hoping he's missing, and that's the, the teaching and research interaction that goes on in, in these place-based uh, institutions that we're used to in the, in the country. So I, I'm, um, I'm hoping he's wrong, but I think the sentiment is important uh, in that we are in a transitional time in technology. Uh, in higher education, and we've got to be cognizant of that and respond to it. Uh, yes. Um, well, of course, uh, you and I are both in uh, in the education business, so uh, I certainly agree. It pays. Uh, uh, it's very important that we be aware of these technology trends and and respond to them. So, uh, speaking of technology trends you mentioned the innovation deficit. So uh, what did you mean by that? What, what's your definition of an innovation deficit? Well, this is actually a, a, quantifi a quantified, um, enti uh, a quantifiable term. Innovation deficit's um, been used. Most recently, it's been put forth uh, strongest by the uh, APLU, the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities, who looked at the global R&D, what share of the global research and development belongs to the United States, which historically has been you know, close to 40 uh, percent, but in the last uh, decade or so has declined fairly rapidly uh, to about a third. And uh, innovation now occurs uh, in, in, a, in a rapid pace in Southeast Asia and South Asia, where there's uh, really been an increase in their share of research and development. I think this has to do with uh, some other overall global trends uh, in, that we're seeing, the growth in the middle class, uh, um, this uh, worldwide global uh, urbanization that we're seeing. But basically, the deficit uh, is is discussed from the perspective, from the American perspective, and that is what's the share of the global R&D that uh, the United States in particular uh, has, and that seems to be uh, dropping. And I think that's a concern 
because it's a concern for several reasons, for just for the, str the strength of the democracy, of course, but also I think uh, in the concern of APLU and others is that this deficit reflects a reduction in R&D in public uh, research in universities, which have historically uh, borne a great share of this R&D. And this, in turn, is probably linked both to state divestment in higher education and the changing federal landscape, political landscape about uh, the view of uh, the federal government in funding R&D. And so it is a uh, I raised it, uh, uh, Rob Hoon and I raised it in our article because it generally refers to only the research institutions. And our goal was to talk about the role of comprehensive universities as perhaps a way to boost R&D in the United States while we fulfill our missions in, in uh, education. And so that's that's the uh, in innovation deficit that we were discussing in this in this okay piece. got it so let me drill down on that just a little bit uh, so with regard to the innovation deficit um, what do you see as uh, the the response of the public research university versus the public comprehensive university yeah, I think that their response is something that probably a lot of people don't see. I think in the last decade, and I've spent uh, time in, in, in my, all my formative time as a faculty member was in research institutions, but I think what you're seeing now there is a recognition that in order to continue at the pace that they're continuing with the reduction in federal funding, that these research institutions have to do a lot more collaborative work among themselves and within the units within the institution. So you see a lot of uh, consortia of uh, research institutions often uh, joined with comprehensive institutions going to federal government or uh, foundations with really broad uh, proposals that now are uh, that uh, include the entire scope of a particular area or look at it from uh, all of the uh, di dimensions of that area. So you see a lot more collaboration. I think the days when you can sum up uh, everybody's research grants at an institution and say that's your R&D are over. There's just uh, a lot more sharing of um, and collaboration. So that's one thing. Um, I think you also see in, uh, and I think the research institutions in North Carolina in particular are doing a really good job of this, uh, something we need to do in comprehensives, and that is they're 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 really very intentionally uh, becoming much more applied, I think, and at least in the rhetoric uh, with the legislature making much easier to understand direct connections between even basic research and economic uh, stability and growth. And I think that is important for uh, both to continue to fuel research, but also to convince the public that this is a really good thing to have universities out there funded, at least in part, uh, by, um, by, the, by the public good. And then I think you also see a lot more direct interaction with business and industry. Uh, you see that a lot in, in Europe uh, already, and particularly in their engineering, and I think you see it now much more. So I think the research institutions are responding to this, even as they, uh, and I think justifiably, caution the public that the federal dollars for R&D need to not be diminished any further, particularly in the area of health, where I think the, the federal government has historically provided a lot of uh, support. Yes, that that uh, support has definitely eroded. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, you know, of a great yeah. great concern to yeah. universities that have a substantial investment in healthcare, either uh, oh, clinical yeah. practice or or academic practice. Another thing that uh, it's like a live wire when you touch the <laughs> subject of MOOCs, M-O-O-Cs, <laughs> yeah. Massive Open Online Courses. Um, and you use the phrase, the initial MOOC hysteria. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so 
<laughs> let me give you a chance to uh, to define that and then uh, settle into the question of what, in your view, would be the uh, proper role for MOOCs. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I, I think MOOCs are fascinating because they have given us an opportunity. Actually, we have to take this opportunity now to rethink uh, what we mean by place in in higher education. And I think that they forced on us uh, a recalibration of the value of teaching and and its relationship to uh, interpersonal um, interactions in a uh, interdependent technology-based global economy. And so I, while I I don't think they will replace. Um, you know, comprehensive universities. Although, you know, I could see how that would happen. <laughs> um, I, I think what they have done is forced us to push back with um, how, with a quality argument about how we integrate what amounts to a pipe uh, a pipe from a prestigious institution about a particular um, uh, a particular area course uh, into these less Easily defined qualitative characteristics uh, that uh, are inherent in place-based higher education. That I believe uh, is what gives American higher education its advantage in developing innovation. So while I think they are, they're they're kind of extreme examples of what technology can do with regard to access, but they leave us guessing as to how that would affect quality. By the way, I had my, um, just to get a picture of what this was like, I I required all of my cabinet members to take a MOOC last year. And uh, interestingly, the dropout rate was about the same as (laughs) nationwide. Is that right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) uh, But uh, but it was a good experience for all of us, and uh, we, we Started to see both the advantages and disadvantages of it, and I've noticed uh, lately there's been a little waning in interest. You know, I don't think they figured out how to make money on it yet. Um, so I, I don't think they're gone, but uh, I think the, I think they've uh, they could enrich the conversation about quality. <laughs> I think that's a good observation. <laughs> so um, since we are talking about innovation, um, I noticed that. Uh, in your article in Table 1, you identify 15 barriers to innovation in the academic setting. Well, sadly, we don't have time for me to ask you about all 15 of those, but let me just ask you about one, one that I've observed over my entire career, 37-year career (laughs) as an academic, and that one is the glacial pace of decision making. <laughs> so I wonder what what you have done at UNCW to address what I perceive to be a a very real and present problem. You know, I can't remember who it was who it was. I think it was an early educator at Harvard or something that that said uh, sh- shared governance w- was intended to make sure that nothing's done for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, but um, the way. You have to do this. One of the one of the key advantages of the American system of higher education and its shared governance is this enforced reflection that we have. And so, while we decry this glacial pace of decision making, we we have to also, on the other side, accept that there are a lot of really good things to going a little slower sometimes. But I think what you have to do ultimately is that for key innovation strategies, you've got to get them out of the traditional academic structure. Uh, and that generally means, and the, the approach that we've taken and we describe in some detail in the paper is that we try to get these ideas out into separate LLCs, uh, the entities, these are business entities outside of the institution attached to a research foundation like ours is or to a foundation where you can operate at the speed of business. And that, um, the, the key there is to make sure that the prerogatives of the faculty with regard to curriculum and so forth, which, by the way, are generally not what you're dealing with anyway in these entities, uh, aren't lost. But that's the way we've done it. We've just got it out. 
we just took it out of the academic sphere and put it into the business sphere. And then you're operating uh, any speed you want uh, and, and actually outside generally of um, state regulations about uh, the uh, the way the university should run. So that's one way to do it. The, the other way is to very carefully nurture some champion in the faculty and find a way to let them move faster. Uh, that's really hard because even if you can find a way for them to move faster, their colleagues may become jealous because you're letting them move faster. Mm. And so, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you've never seen that in your or <laughs> never, not in, in my entire career. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 not in Virginia. No. So, right. But um, that's the only way I could figure out how to do it is to just get it out of there. And um, now, what I have discovered is that while there's some resistance to doing that, once you do it, there's a, usually a lot of buy-in, and generally people inside the institution um, will want to join. And I've found that there are a great number of people in the institution who are also frustrated by the pace of movement and also understand the importance of the reflection, which we hold so dear. Mm. Um, oh, man, that's a, that just touched on so many topics that I think are really important, and they're very timely, and they're very relevant. Uh, I know that, that in my uh, – partnering with uh, corporate entities where they are chosen as primes and the university would be a right. subcontractor to them, once that relationship is established, the federal government can issue a task that needs to be the, – the, that the cost proposal needs to be turned around in two weeks, exactly. and that always bedevils a university to try yeah. to put out any kind of proposal with a budget in that that amount of time. Well, since we are still talking about these barriers uh, to innovation, let me ask you about one other one, um, the one that I, that I have heard discussed by every faculty member who's ever tried to work with any kind of a corporate entity, and that is how do you handle the ownership of intellectual property? So what does UNCW do? Well, we don't uh... – We've changed our strategy on this. We can't, the most comprehensives cannot afford to defend your intellectual property. You, um, you know, you can uh, take patents out, but you have to defend those. You're always going to lose to somebody who really wants that. And I, I think that the way to do it is to, is to take a more um, open source approach to this and talk to the companies about uh, deferred well, how, how should I say this, equity interests rather than um, in distant sort of activities. Um, so we don't try to retain a lot of our intellectual property. We will look at a, at a, um, a faculty member. They have a particular idea. We'll decide whether we want to, uh, to keep it. Uh, but most of the time we don't. Um, and when we do want to keep it, we're going to keep it to share. We're not going to keep it to hold on to, and we just can't afford to do that. I don't even think research institutions can't afford to do that anymore. I mean, I think at Chapel Hill, they just basically everybody signs away. It, it's, it, it is something that we have to uh, spend a lot of legal time on. I mean, we, we spend, even as a comprehensive university, we're spending uh, all this money on outside legal counsel to defend intellectual property when we could be in business with uh, a partner you know, sharing it, and I think that's our approach. Okay, that's um, uh, very interesting and I think very forward-looking. I know that uh, the general attitude that I see uh, in universities is let's try to hold on to everything in hopes that we eventually hold on to some sort of home run. Right. And as you say, defending against – uh, all, all the people who want to practice the invention of a patent yeah. is is just not practical. You can't no. do that. Yeah. It doesn't work either. I don't think, and I wish I had my hands on these data, but uh, the whole, there are very few home runs. Yes, yeah. There's that's that. there's a lot more value to to, uh, to generating collaborations and business partnerships. Ultimately, even on the revenue side for everybody, that's 
kind of the approach we took. Maybe we didn't have any choice in taking it, but that's what <laughs> well. I think that's a. I think that I personally think that's a good position. So that leads me up then to um, maybe my next to last question is. Um, as you think about all of these issues that we've discussed, and you have thought about those, um, your conclusion was that you uh, you needed to form a center for innovation and entrepreneurship. So tell us a little bit about how that works. We surveyed the economic development landscape here with the goal of trying to figure out how UNCW could be a full partner in that. And what we discovered was that this particular area of North Carolina is rich in entrepreneurs. Uh, and the reason is they retire here to live on the beach. And many of them are serial entrepreneurs in their mid fifties who've they hit the lottery, they've sold you know, they they've sold companies for hundreds of millions of dollars. They're very active, very interested in higher education. So I got with them and said, how can we start to develop an entrepreneurial culture in Wilmington that complements the traditional buffalo hunting kind of economic development where we try to get companies to come here and then the kind of economic development that we were already doing to sort of sustain mid-level, mid-sized companies. They said, well, the let's see how they do it in Research Triangle Park and, and Austin and the other places. So we just did that. And we concluded a couple things. One is we needed a place that uh, could be both an incubator and an accelerator close to the institution. A lot of towns have these. And uh, so we uh, we needed that. We needed to go at more than a glacial pace, so we, we organized this outside the university. Uh, we needed to have the buy-in of local entrepreneurs so that they would come and work at this place and be uh, continuous uh, advisors and resources for people trying to start new companies. We needed to focus on high impact, high growth companies in a couple areas that are very strong here, computer science um, and uh, pharmaceuticals, marine science, uh, things like that. The thing that was different about what we did was that when you get all that together and you have a great place, our foundation went out and bought a strip mall close to campus, so we have a wonderful, there's a picture of our center in the in the paper. The one thing we did not have and most of these organizations don't have, is a direct way to connect ideas with people with money. So we started, we did two things. We had to find a director for this who is not an academic. We had to find a director who's had experience in connecting ideas with money. That is, people who knew about uh, venture capitalists in the region, who had sort of gotten them together with ideas, who knew how to take people with ideas and get their proposals ready to show to folks. We had three searches before we found somebody. We finally did. Uh, and then the second thing we did was we had to figure out, we wanted to see if we could actually get a fund, a venture capital fund in residence. And three entrepreneurs in town agreed to try to do this. And that's the Seahawk Innovation Fund. They share, we give them space in, the, in this uh, building. They actually have about I think they have 10 employees now. I mean, they're, uh, uh, we loan them our executive director, which is legal and, and uh, the system that we've set up. But we wanted to go a step further. We wanted to actually be a partner in this fund. And so we were able to do that. We set up an arrangement with them where the research foundation of the institution is a special limited partner of the Seahawk Innovation Fund. So if the Seahawk Innovation Fund does a deal that will give money to its partners, we stand a chance to get a share of the revenue. And our input is not real money, it's the facilities and the loaning of the executive and so forth. Then we had one other thing we had to do <laughs> since okay, we stand to, well, we, we stand to actually gain revenue from a, a deal that the Seahawk Innovation Fund does, but Accepting the revenue could jeopardize our nonprofit status. So we were the first university in the state to put a for-profit corporation onto our research foundation. So we have a for-profit corporation sitting there that can accept money, pay the taxes, and gift it to the university without jeopardizing our status. So all that apparatus, which is described in one of the figures, uh, has now blossomed into um, 
an entity that spun off about 14 companies and uh, produced, we think, close to 40 jobs in the uh, 90 to 110 thousand dollar range in the region. And I'll tell you one other thing I did. I went to we went to the city and said we want you to help you fund this because this can be part of your economic development portfolio, and we will agree to be judged on economic metrics, not academic metrics. So you give us money to help fund this, which they've done, and we'll tell you how many jobs and companies we create, and that you can judge our performance based on that. So we've started to develop this ecosystem. Now I can tell you that people from all over the state who have money and invest in entrepreneurs now come here. And I'll give you one really cool example. There's a kid over here. I was over there a couple months ago, and there was a kid over there. He looked like a kid. He just graduated from high school, and he had space in our facility. And I asked him what he's doing. He said, well, I got this company, and he's got investors from this company. In fact, I know some of the investors. He's actually raised a lot of money. And this, this is a, this a is high school high kid. School graduate. Yeah, this high school graduate. And I said, well, what were you going to do if you hadn't started this company? And he said, oh, I got accepted to Stanford. I just decided to stay here and do this company first. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> oh, and I wow. told him, I said, well, I think Stanford will take you later. Yeah. But his, well, the funny thing about it, his chief assistant was a junior high school kid. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So they were, they started this company. Now, he wouldn't tell me uh, what they're what, doing, what, what the thing is. He's mm -hmm. a musician. Uh, one of his investors is a close friend of mine said mm -hmm. he would he wouldn't tell me either but he says mm -hmm. it's really cool okay and so we have uh we've just started to see that in this place a lot of uh and not all students of ours they're local people faculty members some of the companies we started for example are faculty companies so that's our that's our um center for innovation and entrepreneurship which we're very proud of oh i can see why that sounds very exciting well, uh, to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us. Uh, Gary Miller, Chancellor of the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, thank you for the conversation. Appreciate it. And best wishes to everyone. Thanks. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Bye.